but is Islam part two? And today we're going to look at the Islamic view of God, origins in history, theology also, some of the, some of the different. It is common in our culture today, in our society today, in, well, in Europe and America, for people to talk about the God of Islam and the God of Judaism and the God of Christianity as all the same God. We're going to see that that is absolutely false. The God of Islam, both in origins, as we'll demonstrate, uh, comes from uh, Arabian paganism. And uh, if you study the theology surrounding the definition of God in the Quran versus the definition of God in the Bible, they're two different gods. Two different gods completely. Uh, so we'll see that. <clears throat> and I'm going to read from uh, Deuteronomy 13. Here's God. God is warning the people of Israel about how to deal with a false prophet. There arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. And the sign or wonder come to pass, where he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken to you to turn you away from the Lord your God which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord God, thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. So if Muhammad teaches a doctrine of God that is different from the Bible, <clears throat> the 66 books of the Old and New Testament, then Muhammad, by definition, is a false prophet. But not only that, as we're going to see, Muhammad took Arabian paganism and adapted it and turned it into his version of monotheism. <clears throat> the central and supreme creed of Islam is found in seven words. La alila illa Allah Muhammad Rasul Allah there is no God but Allah on Muhammad is Allah's apostle some will say prophet the word actually is better translated apostle this is the motto of Islam this is the central tenet of Islam <clears throat> it's the pillar of Islam is recited to infants to welcome them into the Muslim faith, people born in a household that's Islamic. It is the last thing that is recited to a Muslim on his deathbed. The exact same words, obviously in Arabic. <clears throat> if a backsliding Muslim wants to be welcomed back into the Muslim faith, he must first recite these words. So this is their confession, their main confession. <clears throat> The central question that we want to answer today is, is all of the one true living God <clears throat> or concoction of Muhammad? Also, is the God of the Bible the word of God who is Jehovah or Yahweh the same as Allah? Are they defined the same way? <clears throat> today we're going to prove that Allah is not the true and living God at all. By first looking at the origins of Islamic doctrine, the Islamic doctrine of God, where did it come from? Then second, we're going to compare <clears throat> uh, the Bible's teaching regarding Yahweh, the God of the Bible, with the Quranic doctrine of Allah, and we'll see that the Bible and the Quran teach two completely different views of God. They're not the same God. Now let me tell you, if your God is not Jehovah, if your God is not Yahweh, if your God is not the triune God of Scripture with Jesus Christ being God of very God, the Son of God, then you're worshiping an idol and you need to repent. And you're not saved, you are damned. Now all it claims that the God of the Bible, <clears throat> Islam claims that the God of the Bible and Allah are the same God. 
They're identical. And they claim that the Quran is the last and best revelation of this God. That's the view. <clears throat> they teach that the biblical patriarchs and Jesus and the apostles worshipped Allah. And we're going to see that this claim is absolutely false, and it can be proven beyond a shadow of a doubt to be false, both logically and through archaeology. <clears throat> Archaeologists have proved that Allah was the moon god. It was the chief deity worshipped by the clan, the tribe of which Muhammad in which he was raised in Mecca, the Koresh clan. <clears throat> he adapted this god, the chief god, the head god of their pantheon, and turned it into his form of monotheism, which is a Unitarian form of monotheism. <clears throat> After noting that the cult of the moon existed throughout the Middle East. The scholar Robert Morey, and it's M-O-R-E-Y, by the way, if, uh, he has at least two books on Islam, both of which everyone should go out and buy. They're excellent. <clears throat> Notes that recent, at his 19th and 20th century discoveries in archaeology, and archaeology is a hard science. <clears throat> in this sense, if you're studying the Maya, or you're studying the Aztecs, and you find a relief, or you find this, or you find that, or you find a statue, or you find pottery. You can't lie and make stuff up. Okay, it's a hard science. This is a pot. This is a Maya, uh, Mayan calendar, and here's the translation. This is what it teaches, and so forth. It's a hard science. Now, in the early discoveries, for example, the Maya and so forth, they made mistakes because they were speculating that they were a peaceful people. Uh, further, Further study and evidence will show that what these mistakes are. That's why it's a hard science. They've discovered that they weren't a peaceful people, that they were uh, skinning people alive and having human sacrifice and ripping the hearts out of people while they were still beating and so forth and offering them to the sun. So it's a hard science. That's important. And here's what he says. <clears throat> and we're going to have a lot of quotes to back this up. The Ur of the Chaldees was so devoted to the moon god that it was sometimes called Ninar in tablets from that time period. A temple of the moon god has been excavated in Ur by Sir Lennon Woolley. He dug up many examples <clears throat> of moon worship that are now displayed in the British Museum. Ron was likewise noted for his devotion to the moon god. In the 1950s, a major temple of the moon god was excavated at Hazor, Palestine. Two idols of the moon god were found. Each was a statue of a man sitting upon a throne with a crescent moon carved on his chest. Now, I didn't bring, I had no way of displaying this, but this book has all these pictures. <clears throat> and one thing I want you to know, every form of the moon god, whether from Babylon or from Palestine or from Arabia, and there's many, many examples of idols that have been found, every single example, the moon is represented by the crescent moon, identical to the crescent moon in Islam. And there's a reason for that, as we'll see. <clears throat> the accompanying descriptions make it clear that they, these were idols of the moon god. Several small statues were also found which were identified by their inscriptions as the daughters of the moon god. What about Arabia? As pointed out by Professor Kuhn, quote, Muslims are notoriously loath to preserve traditions of earlier paganism and like to garble what pre-Islamic history they admit to survive in anachronistic terms, end of quote. <clears throat> During the 19th century, Arnold, Pelavi, and Glasser went to Southern Arabia and dug up thousands of Sabian, Minan, and Qatabinian inscriptions which were subsequently translated. In the 1940s, archaeologist G. Canton Thompson and Carlton S. Kuhn made some amazing discoveries in Arabia. <clears throat> During the 1950s, Wendell Phillips, W.F. Albright, my Old Testament professor in seminary, studied under Albright. Richard Bauer and others excavated these Kataban, Timna, and Marib, the ancient capital of Sheba. 
<clears throat> Thousands of inscriptions from walls and rocks in northern Arabia have also been collected. Reliefs and votive bowls used in the worship of the daughters of Allah have also been discovered. Now keep in mind, uh, the moon god is the chief deity, and under, under the moon god you have all these daughters, which are lesser deities. And the word Allah really was used for the chief deity, whatever god you worshipped, it was the chief deity. <clears throat> the three daughters, Alat, Al Uzza, and Manat, are sometimes depicted together with Allah, the moon god, represented by a crescent moon above them. <clears throat> The archaeological evidence demonstrates that the dominant religion of Arabia was the cult of the moon god. And I didn't uh, do it, for example, but if you, I should have done this. You go through the Bible, there are several uh, passages in, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, <coughs> where the worship of the moon and the stars is condemned explicitly. And this is what was going on in Arabia. Keep in mind, the moon god is the chief deity. When Israel fell into idolatry, it was usually to the cult of the moon god. In Old Testament times, Nabonidus, 15, uh, 555 to 539 BC, the last king of Babylon that built Tamna, Arabia, as a center of moon god worship. Siegel stated, quote, South Arabia's stellar religion has always been dominated by the moon god in various variations. End of quote. Many scholars have also noted that the moon god named Sin is part of such Arabic words as Sinai, the wilderness of Sin, and so forth. <clears throat> when the popularity of the moon god waned elsewhere, the Arabs remained true to their conviction that the moon god was the greatest of all the gods. While they worshipped 360 gods at the Kaaba in Mecca, now just stop for a moment, keep in mind the Kaaba. Uh, the center of their worship was a black meteorite which they built a cube around if you're a Muslim you have to make uh, in your lifetime you have to make a pilgrimage to the Kaaba once in your lifetime to be a faithful Muslim and what they do is they run around the Kaaba in circles and they kiss the Kaaba which by the way comes from pagan worship of the moon god of which Mecca was the center of which uh, Muhammad's tribe was the keeper of the Kaaba. So we see all these things fit together. There's proof, there's historical proof, there's archaeological proof that Islam comes from Arab paganism. It was built on top of it. <clears throat> well, they worshiped 360 gods at the Kaaba. In Mecca, the moon god was the chief deity. Mecca was in fact built as a shrine for the moon god. <clears throat> this is what made it the most sacred site of Arabian paganism. In 944, G. Canton Thompson revealed in her book, The Tombs, of, and, the Tombs and Moon Temple of Gereda, that she had uncovered a temple of the moon god in southern Arabia. The symbols of the crescent moon and no less than 21 inscriptions of the name Sin <clears throat> were found in this temple. And by the way, he's got pictures. I didn't bring the pictures. An idol, which may be the moon god himself, was also discovered. This was later confirmed by other well-known archaeologists. <clears throat> the evidence reveals that the temple of the moon god was active even in the Christian era. Evidence gathered from both North and South Arabia demonstrates that the moon god worship was clearly active in Muhammad's day, and it was still the dominant cult. <clears throat> now, keep in mind once again, Muhammad's family was in charge of the Kaaba. They were in charge of upholding this cult. So when Muhammad switched to monotheism, his form of monotheism, which has nothing to do with the true God of the Bible, it's Unitarianism, <clears throat> he picked the chief deity and just got rid of the lesser gods. Do you understand? And that we could prove this. According to numerous inscriptions, while the name of the moon god was Sin, his title was al Ilah, and that's been shortened through history to Allah, the deity, meaning that he was the chief or high god among the gods. <clears throat> As Kuhn pointed out, the, the god Il or Ilah was originally a phase of the moon god. That's the crescent moon. The moon god was called al Ilah, the god, and was shortened to Allah in pre-Islamic times. 
The pagan Arabs even used Allah in their names given to their children. <clears throat> For example, both Muhammad's father and uncle had Allah as part of their names. The fact that they were given such names by their parents proves that Allah was the title for the moon god even in Muhammad's day. Professor Kuhn says, quote, similarly under Muhammad's tutelage, the relatively anonymous Allah became al Ilah, the god or Allah, the supreme being. This fact answers the question, why is Allah never defined in the Quran? And why did Allah assume that the pagan Arabs already knew who Allah was? That's absolutely true, by the way. <clears throat> Muhammad was raised in the religion of the moon god Allah. But he went one step further than his fellow pagan Arabs. While they believed that Allah, the moon god, was the greatest of all gods and the supreme deity in the pantheon of deities, Muhammad decided that Allah was not only the greatest god, but the only god. And you know that Islamic phrase, Allah is the greatest. Which Muhammad Ali picked up, I am the greatest, I'm the greatest boxer. That whole phrase comes from the worship of the moon god because that was said of the moon god. He's the greatest of the gods. That's what it means. We don't say Jehovah is the greatest because there is no other gods besides Jehovah. In effect, he said, look, you already believe that the moon god Allah is the greatest of all gods. <clears throat> all I want you to do is accept the idea that he is the only god. I am not taking away the Allah you already worship. I am only give, taking away his wife and his daughters and all the other gods. And this is seen from the fact that the first point of the Muslim creed is not Allah is great, but Allah is the greatest. He is the greatest among the gods. Why would Muhammad say that Allah is the greatest except in a polytheistic context? The Arabic word is used to contrast the greater from the lesser. <clears throat> that this is true is seen from the fact that the pagan Arabs never accused Muhammad of teaching a different Allah than the one they already worshipped. This Allah was the moon god according to archaeological evidence. <clears throat> Muhammad thus attempted to have it both ways. To the pagans, he, he said that he still believed in the moon god Allah. To the Jews and Christians, he said that Allah was their god too. <clears throat> but both Jews and Christians knew better, and they rejected the god Allah as a false god. And thus, Muhammad had to whip out the sword. You bow the knee to my god. Al-Kindi, one of the earliest Christian, uh, early Christian apologists against Islam, pointed out, that Islam and its God Allah did not come from the Bible, but from the paganism of the Sabaeans. They did not worship the God of the Bible, but the moon god and his daughters Al-Uzza, Allah, and Manat. Dr. Newman concludes his early study of the early Christian Muslim debates by stating, Islam proved itself to be a separate and antagonistic religion which had sprung up from idolatry. Islamic scholar Tisa Farah concluded, quote, there is no reason, therefore, to accept the idea that Allah passed to the Muslims from the Christians and Jews. End of quote. The Arabs worshipped the moon god as a supreme deity. But this was not biblical monotheism. While the moon god was greater than all other gods and goddesses, this was still a polytheistic pantheon of deities. Now that we have the actual idols of the moon god, it is no longer possible to avoid the fact that Allah was a pagan god in pre-Islamic times. Is it any wonder that the symbol of Islam is the crescent moon? That a crescent moon sits on top of their mosques and minarets. That a crescent moon is found on the flags of Islamic nations. Every Muslim nation has a crescent moon on it. Did you know that? <clears throat> and we just, uh, in the United States, President Obama and Hillary Clinton helped overthrow uh, Gaddafi. And that's being replaced by an Islamic state. And on their flag is the crescent moon. Now think about it. Why in the world would a monotheistic religion that claimed to believe in the true God be obsessed with the crescent moon? Why? What does that have to do with God? Well, if, you, if it comes from paganism and the worship of the moon god, it makes perfect sense. 
The fact that Muslims fast during the month in which begins and ends with the appearance of the crescent moon in the sky. Did you know that? Ramadan. When the crescent moon appears, it starts. When the crescent moon reappears, it, start, it ends. Did you know that praying to Mecca, their, their uh, custom of praying to Mecca comes from paganism. All the worshipers of the moon god would pray to Mecca. The pagan Arabs worship the moon god Allah by praying towards Mecca several times a day, making a pilgrimage to Mecca, running around the temple of the moon god, god called the Kaaba, kissing the black stone, killing an animal and sacrifice to the moon god, throwing stones at the devil, fasting for a month that begins and ends with the crescent moon, giving alms to the poor, and so on. Let me stop for a moment. Every single one of those things is a key tenet of Islam. Every single one of those things has been proven to come from pagan, uh, Arab paganism. Every one of them. If, you, if God is the one true God, why in the world do you run around a black meteorite and kiss the stone in the Kaaba? Why? What would that have to do with the one true God unless it comes from Arab paganism? <clears throat> The Muslims claim that Allah is the God of the Bible and that Islam arose from the religion of the prophets and apostles. It is refuted by solid, overwhelming archaeological evidence. Islam is nothing more than a revival of the ancient moon god cult. It has taken the symbols, the rites and ceremonies, and even the names of its god from ancient pagan religion of the moon god. As such, it is sheer idolatry and must be rejected by all those who follow the Torah and the Gospel. <clears throat> now, it's pretty clear, isn't it? Keep in mind, there are big evangelical churches today that are ha inviting Muslims to come and worship with them. These are, these are not liberal churches. We expect liberals to act like morons. We expect liberals to uh, follow Satan. But these are professed evangelical churches that are advising, by inviting Muslims into their worship, saying, well, we worship the same God. It shows they do not know history, they do not know archaeology, and they certainly don't know theology. For when we look at the theology of Allah in the, in the Quran, we'll see it's not the God of the Bible whatsoever. <clears throat> now the view that Muhammad, and I think Muhammad was influenced by Jews and Christians. Keep in mind, it was a big trading area. And he would encounter Jews and Christians. And he learned that they worship one true God, and that's where he got the idea. I don't think he came up with the idea on his own at all. He took a pagan religion. He adapted it to monotheism. Uh, this view is widely held by independent scholars all over the world. And is even held by some Muslim scholars. And some of the best books written on this are by Muslims. Probably ex-Muslims, but it's quite clear. If Allah was the only true and living God, then why would he take the name of a pagan God? Why would he? Moreover, the true and living God told us his name over 1,500 years ago before Muhammad was born. Exodus 2, 13 to 14, says this. <clears> then <throat> Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, uh, we, don't know the con we don't know the vowels. We have the consonants. We don't know the vowels. So Yahweh is a guess. But that's the closest we can come up to God's name, Yahweh. It's not Allah, it's Yahweh. Allah is not a transliteration of Yahweh. It is the name of the moon god, the chief deity of Arab paganism. If the true God revealed himself to Muhammad, he would have given Muhammad the correct name. He did not. <clears throat> Now, Muslims have an argument for this, and they'll say, well, the first translation of the Old Testament into Arabic, which occurred, oh, I forget, 9th century, 950 or so, translates the word God 
Elohim and to Allah. Therefore, they argue that the translators recognize the correspondence between Allah in the Quran and the God of the Bible. This point actually only proves that the translators made this cho choice out of pragmatic considerations. If they put a different word, which is what I would have done, they put a different word in there, and they put a footnote saying that it would be totally inappropriate to use the name of a pagan deity for Jehovah, what would have happened to them? Well, they, they would have had their heads cut off. So these are people trying to reach out to Muslims in the, in, in the 900s, <clears throat> the 10th century, excuse me, 10th century, 900s. And so they made a translation, and they, they chose Allah because that was what they were using for their monotheistic version of God. It was a pragmatic decision. The view of scholars is that Allah is the chief deity of the gods, and that among the heathen Arabs of Mecca in the days of Muhammad, the chief god was Allah, the moon god symbolized by the crescent moon. <clears throat> Just a few more quotes on this fact. So I think it's important. If somebody could come to me and prove to me that Jehovah was a pagan god, and that Moses or somebody came along and, and just adapted a pagan religion, I would abandon Christianity today. Somebody could prove that to me. It's never been proven. Now, modernist scholars have speculated that the religion of the Jews evolved out of polytheism, but that's pure speculation. They have no evidence of that. The evidence is quite clear, actually, that the true and only God went to Abraham and was that way from the beginning. It had nothing to do with paganism ever. But that's not true of Islam. <clears throat> Matthew S. Gordon, in his book Islam, says this. Some of the early Arabs also revered certain gods and goddesses. Although these divinities varied according to the tribe or area of the peninsula, there seems to have been a common belief in at least one of, uh, in at least one of these gods, Allah, the creator of the universe. Allah was probably considered the supreme god, but unlike the other deities beneath him, he was thought to have little involvement in the daily lives of people. J.C.O. Mashe, who is this Allah? writes this. Historians like Bakidi have said that Allah was actually the chief of the 360 gods being worshipped in Arabia at, at the time of Muhammad rose to prominence. Ibn al-Kalbi gave 27 names of pre-Islamic deities. Interestingly, not many Muslims want to accept that Allah was already being worshipped at the Kaaba in Mecca by Arab pagans before Muhammad came. Some Muslims become angry when they are confronted with this fact. But history is not on their side. Pre-Islamic literature has proved this. Okay, they can ignore it all they want. It's a fact. Okay, we can prove historically and archaeologically that they're worshiping an idol. Even Warren, why I'm not a Muslim, wrote this. Islam owes its name, the term Allah, to the heathen Arabs. <clears throat> we have evidence that it entered into numerous personal names in northern Arabia and among the Nabataeans. It occurred among the Arabs of later times in Theophorus names and, uh, and on its own. Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics says this. In any case, it is an extremely important fact that Muhammad did not find it necessary to introduce an altogether novel deity, but contented himself with ridding the heathen all of his companions, subjecting him to a kind of dogmatic purification. Okay, he took what was pagan and purified it. Arthur Jeffrey in his book, uh, Islam, Muhammad, and His Religion, says this, the name Allah, as the Quran itself is witness, was well known in pre-Islamic Arabia. Indeed, both it and in, in its femin feminine form, Allah, are found not infrequently among the Theophorus names and inscriptions from North Africa. Encyclopedia of Original and Ethics says this, Allah is the proper name only to their Arabs' particular God. Peculiar God. Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics Islama, Allah is a pre-Islamic name. Encyclopedia Britannica, Allah is found in Arabic inscriptions prior to Islam. Encyclopedia of Islam. The Arabs before the time of Muhammad accepted and worshipped after a fashion a supreme god called Allah. Encyclopedia of Islam. Allah was well known to the pre-Islamic Arabs. He was one of the Meccan deities. Encyclopedia of Islam. Ilah appears in pre-Islamic poetry. By frequency of usage, Al-Ilah was contracted to Allah, frequently attested to in pre-Islamic poetry. This, uh, this is from the Encyclopedia of World Mythology and Legend. 
The name Allah goes back before Muhammad. Encyclopedia of Ritual and Ethics. The source of this Allah goes back to pre-Islamic times. Allah is not a common name meaning God or a God, and the Muslim must use another word uh, or form if he wishes to indicate any other than his own particular deity. The Bible and Islam. Allah was already known by name to the Arabs. Encyclopedia of Gods. Allah preserved in pre-Islamic times as the creator of the earth and water, though not at that time considered monotheistically. Allah, Austral and Tudyari goddesses, pre-Islamic, one of the three daughters of Allah. Encyclopedia of Gods. Manat goddess, pre-Islamic, one of the so-called daughters of Allah. Dictionary of non-classical mythology. Allah originally applied to the moon. He seems to be preceded by Imaka, the moon god. Allah, the female counterpart to Allah. Oxford Dictionary of World Religions. Allah, before the birth of Muhammad, Allah was known as the supreme, but not the sole god. A short history of philosophy. Before Islam, the religions of the Arabic world involved the worship of many spirits called jinn. Allah was but one of many gods worshipped at Mecca. But then Muhammad taught the worship of Allah as the only God, whom he identified as the same God worshipped by Christians and Jews. Uh, Kenneth Craig called the minaret. The name Allah is also equivalent in archaeology and literary remains of pre-Islamic Arabia. William Montgomery Watt, Muhammad's Mecca. In recent years, I have become increasingly convinced that for an adequate understanding of the career of Muhammad and the sources of Islam, great importance must be attached to the existence in Mecca of belief in Allah as a high God. In a sense, this is a form of paganism. But it is so different from paganism as commonly understood that it deserves special, separate treatment. He writes again. The use of the phrase, the Lord of this house, makes it likely that those Meccans who believed in Allah as a high God, and they may be, have been numerous, regarded the Kaaba as his shrine, even though there were images of other gods in it. There are stories in the Sira of pagan Meccans praying to Allah while standing beside the images, the image of Hubal. Okay, Hubal is the Arabic counterpart to Baal, the god worshipped in Palestine, the god uh, with a small g worshipped in Palestine. <clears throat> Alfred Gullion says this, the customs of heathenism have left an indelible mark on Islam, notably in the rites of the pilgrimage, on which more will be said later. So that for this reason alone, something ought to be said about the chief characteristics of Arabian paganism. The relation of this name, which in Babylonia and Assyria became a ge generic term, simply meaning God, to the Arabian ilah, familiar to us in the form of Allah, which is compounded of all, the definite article, and ilah, by elighting the vowel I, is not clear. Some scholars trace the name to South Arabian ilah, a title of the moon god. This is a matter of antiquarian interest. It is clear from Nabataean and other inscriptions that Allah meant the God. The other gods mentioned in the Quran are all female deities, Allah, al Uzza, and Manat, which represented the sun, the planet Venus, and fortune respectively. At Mecca, they were regarded as the daughters of Allah. As Allah meant the God, so Allah meant the goddess. As well as worshipping idols and spirits found in animals, plants, rocks, and water, the ancient Arabians believed in several major gods and goddesses whom they considered to hold supreme power over all things. The most famous of these were Allah, al Uzza, Manat, and Hubal. The first three were thought to be daughters of Allah, God, and their intercessors on behalf of their worshippers were therefore of great significance. Hubal was associated with the Semitic god, Baal, and with Adonis and Tammuz, the gods of spring, fertility, agriculture, and plenty. Hubal's idol used to stand by the holy well inside the sacred house. It's the Kaaba. It was made of red sapphire, but had a broken arm until the tribe of Koryash, that's the tribe Muhammad comes from, who considered him one of their major gods, made him a replacement in solid gold. <clears throat> in addition to the sun, moon, and the stars, al Zuhara, the Arabs worshipped the planets, Saturn, Mercury, and Jupiter. The stars of Sirius, Cannabis and the constellation of Orion, Ursa, major and minor, and the seven Pleiades. Some stars and planets were given human characters, according to legend. Al 
Darvan, one of the stars of the Heides group, fell deeply in love with Al Thuraya, the fairest of the Pleiades stars. With the approval of the moon, he asked her hand in marriage. Encyclopedia of World Mythology and Legend. Along with Allah, however, they worship the host of lesser gods and daughters of Allah. Howard F. Vaughn, editor of Religions in a Changing World. Quote, it must not be assumed that since Muslims worship one God that they are very close to Christians in their faith. The important thing is not the belief that God is one, but the conception that the believers have of God's character. Satan also believes and trembles. As Raymond Lowell, the first great missionary to Muslims, pointed out long ago, the greatest deficiency in the Muslim religion is its conception of God. For as we know, Jehovah, the God of the Bible, known both to Jews and Christians, is revealed much differently than Allah, the God of Islam. Here's the World Book of Encyclopedia. Allah was the name of a god whom the Arabian, uh, Arabs worshipped many centuries before all Muhammad was born. <clears throat> and this is um, Samuel Zemmer, the Muslim Doctrine of God. But history establishes beyond a shadow of doubt that the, even the pagan Arabs before Muhammad's time knew their chief god by the name of Allah, and even in a sense proclaimed his unity. Among the pagan Arabs, this term denoted the chief god of their pantheon, the Kaaba, with its 360 idols. John Gilchrist, the temple, the Kaaba, and the Christ. There is no corroborative evidence whatsoever for the Quran's claim that the Kaaba was initially a house of monotheistic worship. Instead, there, is cert there is certainly is evidence as far back as history can trace the sources and worship of the Kaaba, that it was thoroughly pagan and idolatrous in content and emphasis. Like I said, I want to emphasize this over and over again. This has been, this is not uh, people speculating. This is not uh, people getting together and having theories. This is confirmed, this is proved without a shadow of a doubt by archaeological evidence. When you do an archaeological dig on a site and you find idols with the crescent moon, called Allah, you cannot deny it. John Van Ness, Meet the Arab. Quote, pre-Islamic days, called the days of ignorance, the religious background of the Arabs was pagan and basically animistic. Though through wells, stones, caves, springs, and other natural objects, man could make contact with the deity. Al, at Mecca, Allah was the chief of the gods and the special deity of the Koryash, Koryish, that's the prophet's tribe. All I had three dollars. All Uza, Venus, most reverent of all, and pleased with human sacrifice. Mana, the goddess of destiny, and Allah, the goddess of vegetable life. Hubal and more than 300 others made up the pantheon. The central shrine of Mecca was the Kaaba, a cube-like stone structure which still stands, though many times rebuilt. Embedded in one corner is the black stone, probably a meteorite, the kissing of which is now an essential part of the pilgrimage. Okay. Before Muhammad, before monotheism, what do they do? They kiss the stone, they ran around the cube, and made pilgrimage. Comes right from paganism. Here's the uh, Gesinius Hebrew and Chaldee lexicon to the Old Testament scriptures. <clears throat> a people of Arabia, of the race of the Joktanites, the Alilai lived near the Red Sea in a distinct district where gold is found. Their name, the children of the moon, so-called from the worship of the moon, or Alilat. Now, that's a bit of overkill, but I, I want to make it crystal clear. This is the fastest growing religion in, in the world. It's the fast, fastest growing religion in the United States of America. Uh, within 50 to 60 years, Europe, Italy, Spain, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, all these countries are going to have a majority population, if current birth trends continue, and there's not a major war. If current birth trends continue, all of Europe will be Islamic in 60 years. Okay. This is, in, in, I think, the greatest threat to Christendom now is no longer secular humanism, which is on the way. Secular humanism is no longer optimistic. It no longer, uh, you know, they, they're not going to give up, obviously, but secular humanism is on the way. Communism is gone, primarily. Secular humanism is seen for what it is. It's a bankrupt system. Islam is on the rise. Islam is going to conquer Europe. Not through the sword, which is what their doctrine teaches, but through babies. 
when you're having six, seven kids and the Europeans are having 1.3, white Europeans, it's just a matter of time. So this is important stuff. Now, it is necessary that we look at this given the fact that leftists and politically correct pluralists keep speaking of Islam as basically the same as Judaism and Christianity. It's not. It's a form of paganism. It is not a peaceful religion as we'll see next week. Nothing could be further from the truth. And MJ Afshari sums up the matter perfectly. He has a summary here that is excellent. In his book called Is All of the Same God as the God of the Bible? Some of the, be some of the best works on Islam are written by people that used to be Islamic and converted to Christ. And they're experts in Islam because they know all about it. Here's what he says. That Islam was conceived in idolatry is shown by the fact that many rituals performed in the name of Allah were concocted, were connected with the pagan worship that existed before Islam. And today, millions of Muslims pray toward Mecca, where the famous revered black stone is located. Okay, that's every bit as much idolatry as worshiping the Virgin Mary by Roman Catholics. It really is. He continues. <clears throat> And here's a good summary. Before Islam, Allah was reported to be known as the supreme of the pantheon of gods, the name of God whom the Arabs worshipped, the chief god of the pantheon, Ali Ilah, the god, the supreme, the all-powerful, all-knowing, and totally unknowable, the predeterminer of everyone's life or destiny, the chief of the gods, the special de deity of the Quraysh, Quraysh, that's Muhammad's tribe, having three daughters, Al-Uzah, Venus, Manah, Destiny, and Allah. Having the temple idol at Mecca under his name, the house of Allah. The house of Allah. The mate of Allah, the goddess of fate. Because the Kaaba, the sacred shrine which contains the black stone in Mecca was used for pagan idol worship before Islam, and even called the house of Allah at that time, because the rituals involved with the Islamic pilgrimage are either identical or very close to the pre-Islamic pagan idol worship at Mecca, because of other Arabian history, which points to heathen worship of the sun, moon, and the stars, as well as other gods, which I believe Allah was in some way connected to. This then would be proof to us that Allah is not the same as the true God of the Bible, whom we worship, because God never changes. Okay, end of quote. God never changes. God has, uh, has defined himself to us in the word of God through sending Jesus Christ. As we'll see in a moment, that the attributes of the God of the Bible and the attributes of the God of Islam are different. And God would never, ever associate himself with paganism in any way. Yet Allah, the rituals of the shrine of the Kaaba, all come from paganism. This is proof positive that Allah is an idol. Allah is the moon god. Now we have seen that there is indisputable proof that the monotheism of Islam is an alteration, an overlay of Arabian paganism. Okay, the evidence for this is so overwhelming, it's, it's mind-boggling. There's so much evidence. And we, have, we really have to thank the British, and uh, perhaps the French, primarily the British, who went in there and did all the archaeology. <clears throat> all that is not Jehovah, but a chief deity of the moon god. Now let's look at how the Muslim doctrine of God contradicts the Bible, and thus is totally heretical and false, number one. <clears throat> Islamic monotheism is Unitarian. It is Unitarian. Now, when I was, uh, I had a campus ministry, and I, I went and I would pass out tracts and witness to people on campus. And Hindus and Buddhists and atheists, they didn't really want to get into a debate with me, they just kind of blow me off. But the Muslims, they were happy to debate, and their number one issue of debate was the Trinity, which they considered tritheism. They had complete no understanding of the Trinity whatsoever, and that's because they've been taught that way. <clears throat> this is something that the Quran emphasizes, and this is the issue where Muslims believe they are superior to Christians. They believe Christian is a, is a degeneration of the true faith. They reject the Trinity as pagan, and they assert the absolute indivisibility of God's unity. In Surah 112, Muhammad defines God in this manner. Quote, say he is God, the only, one and only, God the eternal, absolute. 
he begetteth not, nor is he begotten, and there is none like unto him. End of quote. Muslims regard this surah as worth one third of the whole Quran. And uh, they say that confess it will shed one's sins away if you confess this. Of course, which is pure superstition. <clears throat> a Muslim apologist writes this, quote, The unity of Allah is the distinguishing characteristic of Islam. This is the purest form of monotheism. That is the worship of Allah, who is neither begotten or neither begets, nor had any associates with him in his Godhead. Islam teaches that this is the most unequivocal, in, in, in the most unequivocal terms, end of quote. And you've all seen the, the beautiful Dome of the Rock in Israel, built on where the temple used to stand, and it's covered with pure gold, that's pure 24 karat gold on there. Beautiful in the sun. And I've seen uh, travel shows, and I've seen film of the inside, and giant letters in Arabic, in huge giant letters around the inside of the Dome of the Rock, these words of God, uh, God's unity, God not being begetting and so forth, are in giant letters all around the Dome of the Rock. That's what it says. <clears throat> also, in Islamic countries, such as Pakistan, whenever a prime minister or a, someone is sworn into office, they have to swear this oath that God is one God, unified, and is not begotten, and does not beget. So this is an essential aspect of Islam. I saw that, I saw a special about uh, Buto of, of Pakistan who was murdered a, a year or two ago, and they showed her swearing this in. This, of course, is an attack on the Trinity and the sonship and the divinity of Christ. Now let me tell you something, if you're Muslim and you're watching this, or listening to this, <clears throat> What you think about Christ is the most important thing that you're going to think about your whole life. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ is God, a very God, in every way, if you don't believe in the divinity of Christ, if you don't believe that he is the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God who's come to earth, you cannot be saved, you cannot go to heaven, you're definitely damned. It's very important that you believe Christ is God. The Bible emphasizes the divinity of Christ because it was necessary for him to reveal the Father and to achieve salvation. As it says in 1 John chapter 1, he was in the bosom of the Father. And in Greek, it's very vivid. He was face to face with the Father. He is the only one uniquely qualified to reveal the Father unto mankind. Because he was with God, and he was God. Okay, he goes way beyond any prophet. And he's the most important person in the Bible. Is Jesus Christ. There's no question about it. And of course, if he was not God, a very God, united with true humanity, he could not offer a sacrifice of infinite value. So if he wasn't God, we're still in our sins. We're going to hell. He had to be God to eliminate the sin of his people. Any religion which denies that Jesus Christ is Jehovah, the second person of the Trinity, is demonic. Now, it is important to know that Muhammad, the Quran, and Muslims do not understand the biblical doctrine of the Trinity whatsoever. They always mischaracterize it. <clears throat> they present it as tritheism, three gods, which is totally false, instead of monotheism. We believe in one God and three persons. There are uh, three interpersonal distinctions within the Godhead. So they are just as wrong, ignorant, and heretical as modern Jehovah's Witnesses. In fact, if you look at Jehovah's Witness arguments against the, the Trinity, they're identical to Islam's arguments, basically. Muslims also do not understand what the Bible means when it speaks of Jesus as God's only begotten Son. They view the eternal begetting of Christ in a carnal, perverted way. That Jesus' sonship implies some kind of sexual generation. So this gross ignorance is shared with the uh, Mormon cult. Okay, so, you have to understand, they don't, when they look at Christianity, they don't understand what it is. They don't understand what it teaches. They have a very perverted view of Christianity. They think of us as idolaters, that we worship three gods. And the Bible is a perversion of the true religion, when it's the other way around. They're, they're basically, they're, they're, they're teaching a form of paganism. 
we must keep in mind that Islam claims that Allah is the same God revealed in the Bible. Well, if this was true, wouldn't they teach the same doctrine about God, right? They'd teach the same things. They would have the same teaching about God's attributes. We would expect the Quran to conform to and reinforce all the biblical teaching about God. But it is quite clear that Islam explicitly contradicts the Bible at several key points. And thus it is not only false, but it is proved to be a work of a false prophet. We read Deuteronomy earlier. How do you know if there's a false prophet? Well, even if he does signs, even if he does miracles in front of you, which Muhammad never did, by the way, but even if he did, if he teaches you to worship a different God than the one defined in Scripture, he's a false prophet. What is the penalty for false prophecy? He should be put to death. Number two, and I'm not going to go into a dissertation about the Trinity. We've all, we all know that the Bible teaches that the Father is God, Jesus Christ is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. They're all prayed to by the disciples. Jesus talks to God the Father. God the Father speaks with Jesus. The Holy Spirit interacts with God the Father and Jesus. So they're not an indivisible unity as taught in Islam. There is three persons of the Trinity. Now, the God of Islam, according to the Quran, is said to be completely unknowable. This comes from paganism. And it's their influence by Greek thinking. Muslims teach that the Quran speaks of the uh, effects of Allah, you can speak of his effects. He has merciful effects. He has compassionate effects. He has effects of judgment and so forth. But we cannot divine God in terms of these effects because these effects, according to Islam, contradict each other. And these effects do not reveal anything about God's absolute essence. See, well, that's pretty bizarre, but that's what Islam teaches. In Christianity, we talk about the attributes of God. God is loving, God is merciful, and so forth. We talk about communicable and uncommunicable attributes. The Bible teaches those. Not Islam. Totally different. Some scholars believe that this concept of the unknowability of God came through Greek philosophical influences, most notably Plotinus, which is a he was a popularizer of Neoplatonism uh, in the days of the post-apostolic church. Very popular in the second, third centuries. And he was popular in the early Middle Ages. <clears throat> Plotinus held that A, God is absolute, absolutely and indivisibly one. Okay, that's Plotinus. He taught B, that God is so transcendent above and beyond his creation that he cannot be known at all except through a mystical experience. Now they the Muslims reject the mystical experience part, except for the Sufi Muslims who accept Plotinus' teaching on the mystical experience. <clears throat> this leads, as Geisler and Salih note, to the form of agnosticism. Quote, Since God has no essence, at least not one that names or attributes of God can really describe. The Islamic view of God involves a form of agnosticism. Indeed, the heart of Islam is not to know God, but to obey Him. It is not to meditate on His essence, but to submit to His will. As Fafander correctly observed the Muslims, quote, if they think at all deeply, they find themselves absolutely unable to know God. Thus, Islam leads to agnosticism, end of quote. Islamic agnosticism about God is due to the fact that they believe God caused the world by extrinsic causality. Indeed, the divine will is so ultimately beyond, which is neither reason nor revelation to God. In the unity of single will, however, these descriptions coexist with those that relate to mercy, compassion, and glory. God is named from his effects, but he is not to be identified with any one of them. The relationship between the ultimate cause, God and his creatures, is it extrinsic, not intrinsic. That is, God is called good because he causes good, and but not because goodness is part of his essence. Despite all the names of God in the Quran, in Orthodox Islam, we confront a God who is basically unknowable. These names do not tell us anything about what God is like, but only how God is willed to act. God's actions do not reflect God's character. Al-Ghazali, Ghazali, uh, the most prominent theologian in the history of Islam, went so far to say, quote, 
the end result of the knowledge of the Arifin, that is those who know, is their inability to know him. And their knowledge is, in truth, that they do not know him. And that it is absolutely impossible for them to know him. End of quote. Now, this is not Christians talking about Muslims. This is, Muslims are proud of this. This is their doctrine. God is absolutely unknowable in any way in his essence, his attributes. Yet these things are, we can only know about his effects from what he does in history. <clears throat> the Bible, however, teaches that God has communicable and incommunicable attributes. He is loving, merciful, compassionate, righteous, just, holy, and so forth, in his own being. And what makes something holy or righteous for us is that it's first holy and righteous in God's being. He's the absolute. The moral law of God is not some arbitrary thing where God makes up rules and regulations. It's based on his nature and character. That's why it's eternal. You see, there's a huge difference between the doctrine of the God of the Bible and the doctrine of the God of Islam. The Bible teaches that although God is transcendent, he is knowable. We can know God. Islam says you can't know God at all. Jesus came to reveal the Father to us. He came that we might know God. He came to save his people so that they would have a real, personal, loving relationship with God. All of this <coughs> is completely contrary or alien to the Quran's Neoplatonic concept of deity. Totally different. Totally different. In addition, Islam teaches that God is impersonal. To speak of God as personal, now we believe God is personal, to speak of God as a personal God, they argue would lo lower God to the level of a creature, to the level of a man. But the God of the Bible is clearly presented as a personal God who both loves and communicates with his people. Islam doesn't believe that. They don't teach that. The Bible emphasizes and teaches that God is a spirit. God is spiritual. And Jesus himself emphasized this point as fundamental to true religion in John 4, 24. Islam rejects this teaching as blasphemous because it demeans the exalted one to speak of him as spiritual. The Bible teaches that God is limited by his own nature or character. It's a very important doctrine. God cannot lie, for example. There are certain things that God cannot do that God would never do. It would contradict himself. God cannot lie, Titus 1-2. God cannot deny himself or do anything immoral, 2 Timothy 2-13. The Quran rejects this teaching and teaches that all is not limited by anything at all. God could lie. God could do all sorts of immoral acts. And it doesn't matter because God's above this, you see. So it denies the Christian doctrine that God is limited by his own nature and character. Because they don't believe that he has a real nature and character as we do. So we have two completely different views of God. One coming from the Word of God, the Bible. The other coming from paganism and Plotinus and Neoplatonism. And this may explain why Muslims are allowed to live, uh, to lie to infidels and so forth. You know that Muslims are allowed to completely lie to infidels. Uh, the 9-11 hijackers, for example, shaved off their beards and were going to strip clubs and getting drunk and doing all these things because they, they wanted to blend in with Western culture. And according to the Quran, that's totally permissible. The people today are corrupted by, in America, by pluralism and politically correct, politically correct thought. And they're, thus they're not taught to think logically or critically. And thus, when we hear politicians, when we hear uh, public school teachers and politically correct people talk about how, oh, the God of Islam and the God of Christianity is the same God. That is not only untrue, it's completely irrational. 
and it shows a complete ignorance of both Islam and Christianity and the Bible. <clears throat> the fact that Christians, Jews, and Muslims are said to worship one God is accepted as a statement that all worship the same God, but this is an assumption. Here's what uh, Murray writes, Maury writes, and we'll end with this. <clears throat> After presenting this material to a group of people, one person responded that he believed that Islam and Christianity worship the same God because they both worship only one God. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. George Bush, President Obama, Hillary Clinton, they all say this. This is, all, this is, this is taught in America today. This is what's taught by politicians. This is what's taught in the public school system. But it's not true. What he failed to understand is that monotheism, in and by itself, does not tell us anything about the identity of the one God who is to be worshipped. In other words, it is not enough to say there is only one God if you have the wrong God. Someone could say that Ra, Isis, or Osiris is the one true God. But this does not mean that Christian and Egyptian deities are one and the same. Ancients could have taught that Baal or Molech was the one true God. Or again, the Greeks could have argued that Zeus or Jupiter was the one true and living God. But merely arguing that there is one God does not automatically mean that the one God you choose to worship is the right one. In this case, the God of the Bible has revealed himself in such a way that his nature and his names cannot be confused with the nature and names of the surrounding pagan deities. The cult of the moon god, which worshipped Allah, was transformed by Muhammad into a monotheistic faith. Because Muhammad had started with a pagan god, it comes as no surprise that he ended up with a pagan god. As the German scholar Johannes Hari pointed out, quote, Muhammad's monotheism was just as much a departure from true monotheism as the polytheistic ideas. Muhammad's idea of God is out and out deistic, end of quote. <clears throat> and we could go on. Islam's version of predestination is complete pagan fatalism. With the Christian form of predestination, the Bible and Christian theologians and Christian confessions and creeds are extremely careful and brilliant in the way they discuss how God predestinates what comes to pass, but God is not the author of sin. God predestinated that the Jews and the Romans killed Jesus Christ, but God is not responsible for their evil actions. The people who do those actions are. In other words, it... it, it it protects the validity of secondary agencies. But Islam teaches pe re rank pagan fatalism. That Jehovah indeed is responsible and does predestinate evil acts. They have no problem with that whatsoever. That's paganism. So once again, to summarize, Muhammad developed his doctrine of Allah out of Arabian paganism. He was likely, in my view, influenced by Christians and Jews he came in contact with. He preferred monotheism. He recognized its superiority. So he took their pagan god, the chief of their deity, and turned it into the Islamic faith. The paganism surrounding the Kaaba in Mecca, the shrine, the cube, the black meteorite, the pilgrimage, praying to Mecca, running around the black, uh, the cube, and all these things, was taken directly from Arabia, uh, Arabian paganism and incorporated into the Islamic faith. And then finally, when we look at the doctrine of God as taught in the Word of God, the 66 books of the Old and New Testament, and we compare it to the doctrine of God as taught in the Quran, we see two, two totally, completely different concepts of God that are incompatible in every way. Concluded, Islam is nothing but paganism. It is nothing but a cult. Muhammad is a false prophet. And Allah, the moon god, is an idol. And as Christians, we must wage warfare against Islam using the Bible, the sword of the spirit, not physical bombs, not physical bullets, unless, of course, there's an actual war with our state. But we need to get this word out, and we need to convince Muslims to repent and worship the only true God, Yahweh, Jehovah. Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the triune God of Scripture. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your sacred word. We thank you that Jesus Christ has revealed you to us. We thank you that he is indeed God, a very God. We thank you that he's your son, begotten from eternity. 
And we thank you that he died on the cross for us to eliminate the guilt and penalty of our sins, Lord. Cause us to worship you and be faithful and to defend your holy name against these false claims. In Jesus' name, amen.